Welcome to Three Count Commentaries. This is your host, Mongo Slay. Today, we got an article from Russellnomics. They went and found themselves, I'm guessing this guy is black. They found themselves a black voice for Russellnomics so they could talk about this uh, Abraham's lawsuit. And it's, uh, it's a doozy. So here we go. It's called Opinion, Privilege in Wrestling. That's the name of the article. It's an opinion piece by Christopher Ely. I want to... Uh, <laughs> This guy, for the record, is some kind of professor. He's a uh, a professor and business or well, political science professor and business psychologist with a PhD in organizational leadership. He also co-hosts the Nubian Wrestling Advocates podcast on post wrestling. Good to say I've never seen this guy before in my life. Never heard of him before. But this is kind of what what happens when you have uh, the race subject bounces around is everybody pushes their black friend to the front so they won't have to deal with it themselves. They're like, oh, race, uh, find the nearest black guy, you black guy, come on over here and talk about this racial thing because I don't want to seem insensitive, you know, so you don't have to think for yourself. You could just port your thinking over to the nearest black person and then just agree with everything they say. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, sure. Whatever you say, black guy, I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> okay. So let's get into this article. Um, so he says, quote, when I ask students in the political science classes, I teach what they think when they think about privilege, students respond with the phrases like having an advantage over someone else. I define privilege as having the luxury of not having to think about issues that another person or group has to consciously think about. Pause. So is it, so is it a privilege that I don't have to think about menopause because I'm male and I don't have to go through menopause? That's a privilege. All right. So how about testicular cancer? I am deathly concerned of testicular cancer. My girlfriend isn't. She's not worried about testicular cancer. She doesn't have testicles. So that's a privilege. It seems as if there's positives and negatives in the world. And these things come individually. Now, there are some group based positives and negatives, like not getting testicular cancer, like not having to go through menopause, like not getting pregnant. So that's something to consider. But is it really that big of a deal that we need to craft an entire society around people who can't or can't or don't have to think about certain things it's like should we consider other people's problems yes should we bend the world around these people's individual problems or even group-based problems no because you're still not going to let blind people drive no matter how bad you feel about them you're not going to let it happen so there's a lot of things that we need to just get over okay let's continue with the article <laughs> When my fiance and I are walking down the street and holding hands, never once do either of us think to ourselves, hey, babe, maybe we should stop holding hands in neighbor in this neighborhood because we might be discriminated against for being straight. Um, is this like the 1960s? Nobody discriminates against gay people for being gay anymore. That's pretty ridiculous, but okay. However, if we were a same-sex couple... It is something we might have to worry about because, let's be honest, in the United States, there are plenty of neighborhoods where same-sex love is frowned upon. Um, depends on what you mean by same-sex love. Because, remember, males can be females and females can be males. So, who is gay anyway? Right? Got to be properly progressive here. You're, you're falling a little bit short in your progressivism. You know, who knows? I might be a woman. Who knows? Um, he's, <laughs> he says, quote, I encourage everyone to think about privilege from this vantage point. If you are white, are you ever afraid of being pulled over for driving while black? If you are a male, are you ever worried about walking into a job interview seven months pregnant and not getting the job because of that? Just some food for thought. Well, the driving while black thing is such an incredible myth. It was created, I think, in New Jersey where they say people are pulled over just for just for being black and driving because, you know, that happens in the real world when in reality, black people speed more than white people do. And uh, we tend to drive recklessly like busted taillights and getting parking tickets and stuff like that more than white people do. And that's why they're pulled over. But 
there's this myth that you're black. Therefore, you just get pulled over just because you're black and you're behind the wheel of a car. It's a myth. It's it's bunk. OK, but the old not getting a job because you're seven months pregnant. Well, why would I give you a job knowing that within 90 days you're not going to be able to work? And I'm going to have to pay you to sit at home. Now, that's the situation that you created on your own, right? That's not something that was foisted upon you by the gods or something like that, like black skin, like testicles, like a uterus or whatever. You got pregnant and then you were apparently you were unemployed or some something like that before you got pregnant. It seems a little irresponsible for you to say, I'm going to go get a job now that I'm seven months pregnant. Because I want to be able to sit at home for a year or uh, several months after I have this baby and you have to continue to pay me. Uh, that seems a little ridiculous. But, but all right, I guess he would say, you're playing right into my hand. Okay, sure, whatever. So he goes into the lawsuit. So you might be wondering why I'm asking these questions and what it has to do with Brittany Abraham's lawsuit against WWE. When I saw how long Abraham's lawsuit, the 33-page complaint was, I immediately regretted volunteering to write an article about this. You should have. After all, in a past life, I was a paralegal and I hated it. I would get cases way longer than this and found the work to be very tedious and boring. But the more I read the case, the more intrigued I was. I actually read it twice just to make sure I understood the complexities of this case. These things should not be complexities, but because of the way WWE and society as a whole is constructed, they are. That there's a secret meaning behind that, a vagary that is not being uh, contested here. But as I said, and I will say this going forward, just because something makes you uncomfortable doesn't mean that it's valid. It, me it may mean that you're neurotic. So we're about to get into this thing. And we've already talked about this lawsuit. So this is going to be a shorter version for those who probably didn't watch that long video. Abraham alleges discriminatory har uh, treatment, harassment, hostile work environment, wrongful termination, unlawful retaliation against the plaintiff due to her race, color, and gender. Okay. She says she had a discriminatory treatment, harassment, hostile work environment. She said she got along with everybody and she got compliments for her work. That's what she said in the complaint. So basically she refuted this <laughs> opening part. I mean, that's not how the law works. But if it did, if it was common sense, you know, the law should be written in a way that the average Joe can understand it. But considering there's legal jargon behind every single word in these complaints, if somebody tells you, oh, yeah, it was a hostile work environment, but I got along with everybody. That's contradictory. That should be thrown out immediately because you're not making any sense. But that's not how the law works. You know, so it's a wrongful termination, she said. Well, she stole a WrestleMania chair. That's why she got fired. You're not wrongfully terminated for stealing. Okay. That's not wrongful termination. Even if other people stole, that's not an excuse to steal. All right. So whatever. So here we go. One idea pitched was to have a dark skinned African male wrestler. Reggie participated in a storyline where he'd be hunted like an animal by Australian wrestler, Shane Thorne. And it says, this is a quote from the, uh, from the lawsuit. In a nutshell, the said hunting gimmick pitch for a new wrestler Shane Thorne and Reggie was, since Shane is Australian, we should make him a, a crocodile hunter. And instead of hunting crocodiles, he hunts people. Okay, remember, this is a 24-7 title situation. He's trying to win the 24-7 title. Reggie has it. It's no different than all of those scenes where our truth is running around with the 24-7 title. It would literally wouldn't have been no difference. It's basically Looney Tunes. And the fact that this guy is supposedly a wrestling fan and has a wrestling podcast and he completely did not at all connect these two ideas that it's the 24 seven title that's involved with this goes to show what kind of intellect we're dealing with. This guy supposedly has a PhD and follows wrestling. They've been doing this for three years. Three years of people running around in circles with the 24-7 title that has included people like EC3 and Jeff Hardy. But once it's Reginald and Shane Thorne is racist. And this person did not at all say it's likely a scene from the 24-7 title, not anything to be too concerned with. It is utilized as if this is a completely valid complaint. It is not. So 
he he continues. Well, I guess if you're black, it's good to know WWE stereotyping isn't just limited to African American talent. If you want to look at that as the glass half full. Uh, well, yeah, because Shane Thorne being an uh, Australian hunter or Steve Irwin or something like that, a crocodile hunter, that is stereotypical. But you also could say it would sound to anybody who has watched the product like this is a 24-7 title scene. But whatever, let's let's continue. Elsewhere, writers pitched WWE Raw champ Bianca Belair say a phrase stereotypical to black women. There was an idea to reveal Mansoor was behind the 9-11 attacks, a storyline where a Muslim woman would be subservient to a man and more. I don't, I read the lawsuit. I don't know anything about the Muslim woman being subservient to a man. I don't know if that was in there. I think it was one of those vaguely implied things. And the Mansoor behind the 9-11 attacks is definitely one of the things that jumps out as something that should not have occurred. Now, is that does that mean that everybody is racist? Does that create a hostile work environment because one guy made a joke about Monster and 9-11? No, but this is how we operate in today's world. He says, quote, yes, ladies and gentlemen, these are claims about WWE in 2021 and 2022. Later in Abrams court filing, it states referring to the idea of Reggie being hunted, quote, as the WWE writing team's sole person of color. Plaintiff was devastated that none of her white Caucasian co-workers stepped in to complain about this discriminatory and offensive pitch, end quote. The above statement speaks directly to the privilege in a WWE's writer's room where none of Abrams' colleagues have to care or even think about how this might come off to black audiences so long as it's, quote, entertaining. Well, as again, ask yourself. Black people sat and watched our truth run around in circles, be chased by white people for two fucking years. Not, I didn't see anybody complain about it. I, I, even all the racially obsessive black people that you know permeate through the wrestling space, I did not see not one of them complain when our truth was running around with the twenty four seven title being chased by white people. I did not see anybody complain about it. Not once. Not once. Not once. Not once. There's plenty of racial grifters on the internet. I didn't see anybody complain about it. Why not? Is Reginald somehow not as black as R-Truth? When you look at their skin color, R-Truth is black as compared to Reginald. Now, Reginald ain't exactly light-skinned, but he ain't nowhere near as dark as R-Truth. So, I mean, okay, let's just move on. <laughs> let's just move on. With all that said, bad ideas are just par for the course for writers. And since a lot of what Abraham's alleges never made it past the cutting room floor, it will likely be hard to prove on the racism front. So I guess the question you might be asking is, am I accusing WWE of being racist? The answer is a little bit more complicated than yes, they are card carrying members of the Klan or no, they are textbook definitions of progressive, which me brings me back to the word privilege. Um, you don't have to be either one, really. You know, and progressives are incredibly racist. They work off stereotypes. What do you think that, that the idea that white people have to consider your race is racism? That you are, because you're a black person, you might be sensitive towards X, Y, and Z. It's like, how about I express it before you go forward with your, oh, I'm sorry, you might be offended by, hold on, you don't know what the fuck offends me. I grew up watching Eddie Murphy and Richard Pryor, and they made fun of everybody, including other black people. And guess what? We all laughed. WWE is no different. I've seen uh, tons of barefoot Samoans, barefoot black wrestlers, Freddie Joe Floyd, the, uh, they made fun of rich people and poor people. They even make fun of, uh, proud Americans. You know, Jack Swagger was a, was a heel character. They made fun of Arabs. They made fun of everybody. That's kind of what brings people together on the product is that you do have everybody getting made fun of. And it does make everybody feel like it's one big group. Like we, nobody is outside. Vince even makes fun of himself for fuck's sake. You know, okay, so we have a situation where everybody gets it. And if everybody's getting it, you're not worse off than somebody else. All right. So it's a we're we're in a situation here, but let's continue because he's gonna try to bring up some examples. Mark Henry, like in life, in wrestling, being black is a full time job. 
Oh yes, yeah, so I'm working. When you're working your racism, yeah, it's a full time job, all right. Especially in an environment where there are very few black writers and no one there to advocate for you. You're you are a grown man. <laughs> so let's continue. On HuffPost Live back in June 2014, Mark Lamont Hill interviewed Mark Henry. In true Mark Lamont Hill fashion, Hill pressed Henry about the stereotypes in wrestling. Yes, because this is what you know, Mark Lamont Hill is the kind of black person I talked about when I started this article. He is white progressives, very black friend. Whenever they need to talk about something racial, they, they, they contact Mark Lamont Hill. You know, he is the perfect puppet for them to say whatever they, they, whatever they came up with over here. They just poured it into Mark Lamont Hill's brain and he says it out of his mouth, but he says it somewhat eloquently. Therefore, he must be like this total original thinker. It's like, no, he thinks men can get pregnant. He didn't think that 15 years ago, I guarantee you, but he thinks it now and he'll argue with people about it on Twitter now. Guarantee you he wouldn't say that 15 years ago. He thought it was retarded like most people did. But Mark Lamont Hill, let's not go down that rabbit hole. I went far enough. Henry was re initially reluctant, but then finally brought up WWE gave him Henry the nickname the Silverback. Yes, there was a point in time in WWE where they were calling Henry a Silverback Gorilla. In the interview, Henry recalls, honestly, I could not do it. I told them I can't do that. I got two little black kids at home. This is the same Mark Henry who was in a storyline relationship with a 70-year-old Mae Young where she gave birth to a hand in the same Mark Henry who was made to look like the butt of a joke when he lured into get, trying to get sex in a segment that can be best described as transphobic. Again, uh, there was no such thing as transphobia when that segment was done, by the way, and nobody thought it was terrible or bad. Now, it was in bad taste because he's in bed with a man. That sucks, okay? I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> I can't tell you, I wouldn't have done it. But... There was no such thing as transphobia. I guarantee you, if you go back in time and mention the word transphobia, everybody's going to look at you like you're you're talking Klingon. Nobody knows what you're talking about. That segment is not transphobic because transphobia did not exist. But, and the fact that it remains a weird thing that people have to go through, especially as now you try to normalize this stuff, yeah, it's going to go a little bit differently than... than uh, it did in this little Mark Henry piece. And what's so stereotypical about the Mae Young thing? There's not a you know plethora of black dudes banging old black grannies. But the silverback thing is, I will agree, I didn't like that. Only because there is no other way to go with it than silverback gorilla. There's just no other way for you to explain silverback. There's literally no other way for you to go with that. So he says, I swear that Henry has the patience of Job for being able to withstand the onslaught of bad storylines that he was given during his WWE tenure. But it's good to know that in 2014, that even Henry believed that comparing him to a gorilla was a bridge too far. There was also a time back in 2008 where Michael Hayes was suspended for 60 days for telling Henry that he was more of a nigger than he was. I swear Henry must have taken the path of least resistance approach to WWE and how this idiot Michael Hayes still has a job in the company after saying something like that isn't that much of a mystery when his boss said the same word on TV. Well, Michael Hayes was, of course, had an alcohol problem. He was drunk as fuck at the time. And then he said and he got suspended, so he got punished for it. The argument now is that the punishment was not sufficient, that he should have been fired for saying something in a drunken stupor. But that's a matter of opinion. So, okay, let's move on. Bianca Belair versus Becky Lynch, hair versus hair. I recall some WWE fans suggesting Bianca Belair be in a hair versus hair match with Becky Lynch. I specifically remember Stephanie Hypes from True Heel Heat's serving face and heels admonishing that idea. I almost brought up the historical context of black women and their hair. Yeah, because black women have some kind of special spiritual connection to their hair that, you know, other people don't have. And therefore, they should be completely absolved of hair versus hair matches, despite the fact that it's a huge draw in like Mexico where people shave their heads all the time and hair tends to just grow right back. Whatever. As angry as I was at the suggestion, I understand there are a lot of fans who don't know this history, but ideas like this are a prime example of colorblind racism that exists in wrestling, where white fans and writers don't even have to think about how storylines affect black people or other people of color. Colorblind racism. Think about that for a moment. That's a new one for your toolbox. Colorblind racism. 
oh, we treat black people the same. That must be racist because black people aren't not the same. They're supposed to have some kind of special X-Men powers when it comes to their hair. No, if you, you created that, that's not anything genetic about you. Well, black women are so sensitive about our hair because of our history and blah, blah, blah. Nobody asks you. Nobody gives a fuck. It ain't about you. Are you going to do it or you're not? It's that simple. But if, if you're an adult. Are you going to do it or you're not going to do it? You know, there is no super secret special history to hair. No, black women's hair grow just like white women's hair grows right out of the fucking head. OK, so the idea that, some, that black women have some kind of special connection to their hair is like, no, you don't. You are creating that history. You're creating that special connection. You're trying to absolve yourself from that. You're trying to create a situation in which you have something special. When your hair is no more special than anybody else's hair. And we've been watching hair versus hair matches. All, and then what happened to the old idea that if men can do it, women can do it. So now it's like men can do it. X-Pac and Jeff Jarrett had a hair versus hair match. CM Punk had a hair versus hair match. Or, uh, I think a well, hair versus mask match with Rey Mysterio. But all of a sudden when it comes to women, we have to think about the super special secret sauce that black women have when it comes to their hair. No, no, no. -uh. If you want to play that women are just as good as men, black women are just as good as black men. Then if a black man can get his head shaved then a white black woman can too. We're not going to do this whole colorblind racism garbage. No, that's made up monkey shit. There is no special connection between black women and their hair. All right. And if they tell you they, they, that there is, it's only because these people want to create that special connection. Because black women, they can wear wigs just like everybody. And hell, 90% of them are wearing wigs anyway. How do they have a special connection to their hair? They're all wearing hair hats and weave. My special connection to my hair. You don't even wear your natural hair anyway. You all walk around in jiffy pup bags on your head. Come on, man. But this again, just you're a puppet. Just say whatever other people have told you to say. And then this one person somehow is, I, I think I've seen this Stephanie hypes person on Twitter. She's a big fan of Becky Lynch. So it's not like she's uh, somehow uh, biased against Becky Lynch. She probably just didn't like the idea. Because she's a black woman. She doesn't want to watch a black woman get her head shaved. Okay, fine. But I don't give a shit. So how does her opinion weigh more than my opinion? Well, she's a woman. So what the fuck does the difference does that make? Oh, I'm sorry. Black women are special. They're queens. If I didn't, you know, whatever. Continuing with the article. I was very happy with the way WWE course corrected. Bianca Belair's loss to Becky Lynch in mere seconds at last year's SummerSlam. For all intents and purposes, Belair is the closest thing WWE ever had and probably ever will have to a female version of Cena. But that someone thought was a good idea is mind-boggling. And keep in mind, this is after they did something similar to Kofi Kingston. Just not giving any consideration to the black kids who were inspired by Kingston's win, instantly defining him down by having Brock Lesnar squash him. I couldn't even fathom Cena winning the title and then losing it in a mere matter of seconds. WWE will instantly think about how it will affect the kids. You know, like John Cena, when he lost to Brock Lesnar, he got absolutely demolished and the crowd was dead fucking silent afterwards. That happened before what happened to Kofi Kingston, by the way. And this is after John Cena was, you know, built up as for a decade of being virtually bulletproof. And Brock Lesnar just walked in there and, and stomped him for like minutes on end. At least Kofi Kingston got a quick death. You know, John Cena got pummeled. You know about Brock Lesnar pummeling Randy Orton and left him in a pool of blood. In the, during the PG era, by the way. You know, think about the babies. Like, yeah, think about the babies. We consider the babies all the time. We do. But sometimes the babies need to be disappointed. Sometimes the babies just need to be disappointed. They need to learn adversity. You know, you got to get over it. All right. <laughs> Brock gone Brock. And I ain't mad at it. You know, what do you want Brock Lesnar to sell for Kofi Kingston? Kofi Kingston is like 122 pounds. What is he going to do against Brock except get thrown around like a goddamn rag doll? Come on, man. It's ridiculous. But they have had like a real match before, but it wasn't really a real match as much as Kofi, again, just got beat up by Brock Lesnar. All right. He continues. Speaking of Cena, 
he got over you using hip hop culture. He even admits that he was dead in the water until he adopted the rapping gimmick. King Eric from off the cuff radio believes that John Cena owes hip hop culture for the way he used it and abandoned it. Once he became mainstream, it's hard to argue that point. If I were a guessing man, I would say that Cena was following marching orders from McMahon. But the point is that when Cena began wearing the Fruity Pebbles shirts and stopped rapping, he had the privilege of being able to turn into what McMahon wanted him to be. This is an interesting subject here because there is a permanent conversation about cultural appropriation, about whether, but this is, as always, this is a two-sided thing. Cultural appropriation is John Cena rapping, Road Dog rapping, um, them having hip hop based gimmicks, you know, uh, Road Dog having dreadlocks or braids or whatever. And, you know, John Cena with the big chains and all this kind of stuff, which is, you know, take it from hip hop culture. And the idea that he abandoned it to go mainstream, which seems to me to be absolutely what happened. He kind of transitioned from that to, from that to some more of chain gang soldier and from that to da, 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 super Cena with the fruity pebble, fruity pebbles shirts and stuff like that. So it was basically baby's first gimmick, the doctor of thugonomics and all this kind of stuff. Right? So if you feel a certain way about Cena abandoning the hip hop, uh, character, now there's positives and negatives to that because some people didn't like that he was a white dude rapping because they don't like right, white rappers and they think white rappers are culture vultures or they're culturally appropriating. So they don't like it anyway. So the fact that he abandoned it and got rid of it will be a good thing to them. And this is sort of the stereotypical progressive point that, you know, you should always get out of, avoid doing cultural appropriation if you possibly can, because what you're doing is you're taking up space in that culture for a black person who is naturally from that culture. In other words, John Cena was in the way because heavens to Betsy, there should have been a black rapper who was just as popular, but that wasn't going to happen because they had done black rappers many times before and has done them since. And they didn't reach the level of success that Cena reached because there's a dog bites man, man bites dog situation to it. Black people rapping is no different than a dog biting a man. It's a story you see all the time. Black people rapping, there's nothing special about that. But there is always something interesting about white people rapping. That always gets people's attention because you don't see a lot of it. Even though you've been seeing it for years. You ain't seen it enough for it to become mundane. There's a commercial out right now where a white man is rapping with Snoop Dogg in the Corona commercials, right? Like um, the white man raps and Snoop Dogg kind of tells him how his rap was terrible and all this kind of stuff. That's kind of how white people rap and is always portrayed from a black perspective. Like you're corny. You're like, you know, all white rappers, man, they all corny. So when somebody actually is getting over doing the rap gimmick, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be like, man, you just do corny. And then that's it. You're not considered cool. You're considered a follower. It didn't naturally come from your, from your culture. So you're following, you're mimicking us. So we naturally believe we should be able to do it better than you. So when somebody actually gets over using rap or when somebody actually becomes successful using rap and that person is not black, like, I don't know how many of you remember the battle rapper named Jin. He was an Asian battle rapper. And everybody was captivated by the fact that he was, not that he was a good rapper, but that he was Asian. Just the fact that he was Asian was like, he, I think he was a champion on 106 and Park or something like that. And um, people was like, oh my God, did you see the Asian kid? Most people didn't even know his name. It was just kind of like the Asian kid. You see the Asian kid? Like, yeah, I saw him. You know, he's corny because he's, he's not black, but he's acting black quote unquote, you know, and that cultural appropriation element of it creates a man bites dog scenario where that gets more attention because if you're actually good at it, that's even better. But most black people will just be like, eh, he's a culture vulture. I ain't paying that no mind anyway. So John Cena moving away from hip hop culture when he became mainstream wasn't something I expected to see black progressive be upset about. I would expect him to be happy about it. Because then he's no longer culture vulturing. He's no longer engaging in cultural appropriation. 
No longer can people connect John Cena with hip hop, even though he dropped a rap album, which was pretty funny, by the way. And it was endorsed by other black rappers like Merce and other, you know, rappers and stuff like that. So it's interesting. It's an interesting subject to discuss. But when you're coming at this thing from a progressive mindset, the progressive mindset makes it more likely that you would be okay with Cena abandoning rap because you already see him as an outsider engaging in some kind of uh, exclusive black culture. All right, let's, we got, we got more here. Jinder Mahal, a heel for being Indian. I recall back in 2017 when Jinder Mahal was given the WWE title. Fans and journalists scoffed and bemoaned this because I really liked the idea of Jinder Mahal being the first of Indian descent. Oh, he says, but I really liked the idea of Jinder Mahal being the first of Indian descent to be a world champion. In the beginning, I thought Mahal did a more than serviceable job in his new role as champ. I then saw an episode of SmackDown where Jinder was made to go out to the crowd and get heel heat, not for being a bad guy, but for simply being an Indian. I really scratched my head at this crap and didn't understand it, but then I listened to an episode of Talk is Jericho. In this episode from 2017, Gen Gender tells a story about Vince McMahon rewriting one of his promos. The, the quote is thus. He had rewritten my promo. The original promo was something totally different, so when I finished calling the match, one of the writers said, hey, Vince changed your promo. I was like, okay, well, bring it to me. Can you please bring it to me? So they brought it to me and I read the anti-American comment and all of that. And I was like, I like the old promo better. It was like I tried being peaceful and nobody was listening. But now I have everyone's attention. I just beat five of SmackDown's very best wrestlers. I did it all alone. Something like that. It was just a regular heel promo. But then the new one was like, you Americans this and that. And I was like, I don't think we should go there. But Vince, but I'm like, Vince wrote it. It's okay. But I did it. And the reaction that it got, I was like, oh man, Vince is a genius. He knows exactly what's going to draw the most heat. So you go from generic heel promo, which probably wouldn't have got over because it it's generic heel promo, to anti-American heel promo. And people are like, wait a minute, I'm American. Boo. You know, <laughs> wait a minute. You're talking about us, you know. Um, I get that. Uh, that has really little to do with being Indian, as much as it to, to do with being foreign, period. Like, you know, the, the foreign bad guy. We've talked about that on this channel before. So <clears throat> he says, quote, of course, Jericho agreed. And they both waxed poetic about how much of a genius McMahon is for the following four minutes or so. All I could do is shake my head and think about the Jedi mind trick Vince played on Mahal to get him to think that go going the cheap heat route that relies on outdated stereotypes is better than cutting an original promo that doesn't rely on that type of antiquated bullshit. Hold on. The Jedi mind trick. It's like, there is no Jedi mind trick. The guy got a, a more fierce reaction when he did the anti-American stuff than he did when he was doing the other stuff. That's not a mind trick that Vince played on him. That's the audience responding more to the anti-American gimmick. And he could be, it doesn't matter that he's Indian. It only matters that he's anti-American. Again, Bret Hart, white as pure snow, did an anti-American gimmick, got booed out of every building he was entering in 1997. It's not a matter of, it doesn't matter where you live. If I was in Canada and I come out making anti-Canadian comments, I'm going to get fucking booed. There's guys in Mexico right now waving the American flag, getting booed. All right. It happens. This, this is very real. That's what it's no different than the away team going into your hometown. And like when Terrell Owens uh, did that uh, standing in the middle of the Dallas star and he got booed out of the arena for it. Like it's no different than that. All right. You aren't from here and you're making fun of this place. It doesn't matter if it's city to city. It doesn't matter if it's state to state. It doesn't matter if it's country to country. It doesn't even matter if it's family to family. If you are making fun of us, we don't like you and we don't like that. That's what a heel does. A heel shouldn't be like, I'm just like you. 
I'm just like everybody else, you know, and it, cause it, at that point, I'm not going to hate you if you're like me. I can only hate you if you're different than me. As a matter of fact, all heels are different from you. If you consider yourself a good person, all heels are different from you. You boo the heel for cheating because you wouldn't cheat. You boo the heel for lying because you don't believe in lying. That's how these things work. All right? Like, that's that's common sense. Like, wrestling doesn't need to be astrophysics. It is simple black hats and white hats. Okay? You, you know, if your city and my city have some kind of rivalry going on and you come here and you say, oh, the Chicago Bears just beat the shit out of the Detroit Lions. Boo! You're in Detroit. Is that cheap heat? Yeah. Does it still work? Yeah. Okay? It, it doesn't matter. Right? All forms of heat is essentially cheap heat when you think about it because cheating is cheap heat because everybody hates cheaters. Everybody hates liars. That's all cheap heat. It's all broad strokes. Wrestling works best in broad strokes. Why would I do something that only specific people get? Why would I? No, I'm trying to reach the masses. The masses need something that connects multiple people together. That's cross generational, cross racial, cross genders. If you are attacking the United States because you're not from here, then guess what? It doesn't matter what I look like. I'm from the United States. I don't like that. That's the point, right? Just like if you were a liar, it wouldn't matter where you come from. You're a liar. I don't like liars. You're a thief. You're a cheater. You know, I don't like that. So the heel having different values and coming from a different place, that's just what a heel is. I have yet to see people tell me what is not cheap heat. You know, almost all of it is cheap heat. Almost all of it. If you really think about it, what is cheap heat exactly? You know, it's, it's low hanging fruit, right? It's something, it's something that is easily noticeable to everybody. So Jinder Mahal wears a turban. He's brown skinned. Neither one of those prevents him from being American, by the way, because you can wear a turban and be brown skinned and be from the United States. I've seen them in Detroit. I've seen them in Dearborn. I've seen them everywhere in American born people. I've seen them wear turbans and have brown skin. That's not a big deal. But if you start talking about being anti-American, it wouldn't matter where the hell you're from. It doesn't matter if you're from Chicago. You could literally be born in the middle of the America's breadbasket. I mean, look at the, the political campaigns. One of the first things they'll tell you is, this guy is anti-American. And people will be like, you know what? He's right. He is anti-American. You know, it's just... It's common sense, man. I can't believe these people have PhDs and they just can't understand this stuff. All right, let's move on. Keith Lee, you don't sound black enough. Keith Lee is a man that looked like he needed someone to give him a big hug his entire main roster run in WWE. He went from being the limitless Keith Lee to Bearcat Keith Lee, the latter a character he couldn't relate to because he didn't know what it was supposed to be. Bearcat Wright was a wrestler from the 1950s who was the disputed first black world champion of professional wrestling before Ron Simmons. In another Talk is Jericho interview, this one from 2022, Lee admits that the McMahon was not a fan of the way he spoke. Lee said McMahon told him that he sounded too smart for his own good. When I heard Lee say that, I was shocked, but not surprised. I guess Lee didn't fit the stereotype of what a big black man should sound like. With the very limited context that I have of this, it comes off as extremely racist. Um, uh, no, he was talking about the look, the sound matching the look. That's what he's talking about. And basically everybody kind of laughs and talks about how Keith Lee is basically professor Hulk. And, um, <laughs> which is funny. Now I personally don't have a, a huge problem with what Keith Lee, um, sounds like, but I think that if he's going to talk the way that he talks, he should change his look. The look should match how he speaks. You can't be super aggressive but talking that way you know he sounds like the butler from fresh prince of bel-air you know without the without the accent <laughs> okay <laughs> that's that's exactly how he sounds but the idea that he he sounds too smart well you got to take into account 
the members of the New Day. All three of them are very smart guys. All three of them are college educated guys. I think Woods has a PhD. He has never gotten the you sound too smart. His character is a nerd. So he sounds like a nerd. And that works for him because that's who he is. Kofi Kingston and Big E and all of them, they sound appropriate to their look. They know how to match their look and the voice. Now, when you start talking about black people in general, when it comes to their ability to connect to the character, you know, there's a lot of rappers who will tell you that, you know, when Nas said was absolutely true, if I sound smart, y'all will run away, you know? There's have been rappers that have been saying that for uh, for a long time. 1996, what was it? Lauren Hill says, for all my logic and my theory, I throw in a motherfucker so the ignorant niggas hear me. They know that if you sound too smart, people will be like, oh, look this, look this shit. You know, they kind of start rolling their eyes and they're not really connecting with that audience. People knew this. It's one of those things where it's a quiet secret in black America that if you sound too intelligent, people do turn off. That's in that's an it's an open secret. Cause you see a lot of very educated black people will code switch, as they call it, right? They call it code switching. It's oh hi Bob. How are you doing? How are the kids, Bob? And then they as soon as they punch out, it's yo, that bitch nigga Bob, man. Fuck that nigga B. You know, it's like, you know, that code switching shit. Everybody knows that stuff exists. All right. The inability for Keith Lee to code switch because he didn't know how to sound, you know, different to match his character is a problem. Okay. And it's continuing to be a problem in AEW because he still pops up and, oh, I am Keith Lee, the elegance of execution. Look at me. Look at the size of my arms. Look at the size of my body. I'm going gray on purpose because I choose to. I'm trying to show you a different world to open up the realities for your infinitesimal brains. And people are just kind of looking at him like, huh? Because he's not getting over talking this way in AEW either. So I don't know. Moving on. All right. He, I guess he's, I guess he's about to wrap it up. Privilege is a luxury in wrestling. I don't think WWE is thinking about the fact that these characters are minorities when they placed in these aforementioned gimmicks and storylines. And unfortunately that is the problem. I'm not sure if Brittany Abrahams will succeed in her lawsuit. Should the case actually make it to trial, I'm not sure whether black wrestlers will testify against her, and I seriously doubt any will stand in the gap for her. It's my hope that all wrestling companies have a diverse writing staff, especially if they're going to rely on the talent of minority wrestlers. I hope that all the minority wrestlers and writers know their value. I'm not suggesting they need to fight the writing staff over every single thing, but when something doesn't feel right, they should be free to vocalize it without fear of being fired the way Abrams was. Of course, ignoring the fact that she stole. The knee-jerk reaction for a lot of WWE fans is to say WWE is not racist. At the mere suggestion that something in WWE might be. I remember when Sasha Banks and Naomi walked out and so many fans just knew for a fact that it was not race related, even though all we got was the ridiculous statement from WWE and nothing from Sasha or Naomi. What would make you think that it was racial related? That's what I want to know. What makes you think it was race related? If anything, it was probably more gender related because they feel like the women's tag team titles were not getting enough focus, that they were not getting enough attention for having the title. That's what they wanted. That's what, you know, Sasha Banks has been talking about since she left. She ain't been talking about anything racial. She's been talking about not having her matches cut, you know, having her, not having her ideas filtered, you know, being able to do all this stuff. Maybe it was gender based, not necessarily race based. But again, when you, when you only got one tool, you know, usually it's a hammer. Everything is a nail. So we're talking about race. So everything has to be racist. Doesn't make any sense. He says, I cannot emphatically say that WWE is racist, just like none of us can emphatically say that they are not racist. The one thing I can say is WWE has a culture problem, and this problem is not brand new. Who cares about the culture? See, that's the thing. Like, black people want to be separate, but then when they get treated like they're separate, all of a sudden it's racist. You know, like, black people have owned the term the culture. Like, whatever, like, what does that even mean, the culture? I guess it just means other black people. Well, they kick other black people out of the culture for not having 
the same brain worm that they have. You know, poor Chrisette Michelle. Is she somehow less black than some other people? No. She she got kicked out of the culture, not because she was she did anything racist, but because she sang the national anthem at Donald Trump's uh, campaign or something like that. All of a sudden, she got kicked out of the culture. What happened to the culture? Why isn't the culture um, diverse? Why does the writing staff need to be diverse, but the culture doesn't? The culture has to be everybody. Well, I guess it is diverse, except for in message. It has to be the same shit for everybody. They kicked Clarence Thomas out of the culture. I'm not in the culture. How many people are listening to this? They're not in the culture. Because you don't want to listen to Cardi B and, you know, Megan Thee Stallion and think that rap music should be dominated by females or that, you know, effeminate males are somehow a good thing in the culture or men in drag or anything else that they have it going on in the culture. All right. Now, I got about another... 15 to 20 minutes to talk to you guys. So let's talk about this. Uh, this is just something that popped into my head as I was ranting about the culture. Uh, Fightful did an interview with a WWE writer named Dave Schilling. This guy also black. Again, everybody pulls out their black friends when it's talking about race stuff, right? So he was a former writer, black guy who worked in WWE. Here's what he had to say. My thoughts were probably similar to a lot of people which are who are of color who work for WWE, which is not terribly surprising that someone would be upset about the things they experience at the company. It's not the best place to work. If you are a person of color, you're a woman, you're LGBTQ. It's difficult because there are a lot of people there who are older, who are maybe not as sensitive to certain things. And at the end of the day, the person who makes the decision is Vince McMahon. Even today, Vince has a lot of power and a lot of say in what's going on and what goes on the air. And Vince isn't the world's most sensitive person. So sensitivity should be on the top of your list of things that you should be interested in when you're writing television or in type of any kind of creative endeavor. Now, this is a very, uh, very interesting thing because he's saying that it's, uh, it's not the best place to work if you're a person of color or if you're a woman. What is the best place to work then if you're a person of color, if you're a person, a woman or LGBTQ? If you're a sensitive person of color, where's the best place for you to work? Uh, if you probably say nowhere, then that's the right answer because you're going to find racism in a bowl of oatmeal if you want to. Again, again, this, this is ridiculous. Let's move on. This guy says it's all about what Vince likes. A lot of these broad caricatures are things that Vince likes. I can't speak to what happened after I left, but I'm sure he thought that Apollo Crews doing an accent was going to get over. You look at the history of WWE and there are tons of examples of stereotypical characters. This is not a new thing or a new phenomenon. Uh, this is not a uh, controversial opinion. He is correct. But the issue is, he says, these are things that Vince likes. These aren't necessarily things that Vince likes. These are things that you see on TV. These are things that you see in movies. What is something that is happening in wrestling that you haven't seen in a movie recently or that you haven't seen on a TV show recently? These are just things that happen in society. These are things that happen in the world. You think that Apollo Crews speaking with an accent is somehow different from any other black person doing an accent like I, I'm stupefied by this because I'm like, where do you not see this stuff that is simply created for like the barefoot Umaga type of gimmick? OK, you never see that in TV anywhere because you very rarely see Samoans on TV. So I'm thinking like, OK, maybe something like that. But. Black people doing weird accents. Yeah, we've seen that all the time. Cross-dressing, yeah. The uh, big hoop earrings, don't make me beat your ass. That's every love and hip-hop episode. That's every rap song. W what about this is different from anything else for you to say specifically as a Vince McMahon problem? It's not. If you don't like it, guess what? It's something that's created within your own culture too. Okay then you should be out policing all of the rappers who are doing stereotypical, terrible things. But you don't. You shut up about that. You wait until there's a white man. And then all of a sudden you got loads to say. Well, he continues. A lot of people have to retire. I don't know if we need to continue to hear what Michael Hayes has to say about storylines. I think he can put together an amazing match, but do I need to hear Michael Hayes or Vince McMahon or Bruce Pritchard tell people in their 30s, 20s, tw children what is entertaining? That is no knock to them, even though it is. They've all done amazing things in the wrestling business and given me decades of enjoyment. They were all very nice to me. 
There needs to be more youthful energy in wrestling. AEW has done a good job presenting their characters in a way that is more appealing to younger audiences. WWE, in a lot of ways, Roman Reigns and the Bloodline are very modern characters and are exciting and cool. And even though they are heels, they are thought of as cool. The people making the decisions are old. At some point, those people need to move aside. Tony Khan, as a booker of AEW, is doing a good job. And he's not surrounding himself with younger people. He's not surrounding himself with a team of writers who say, this is cool, this is not cool. Not to say Tony doesn't know what's cool. He's probably my age. And as checked out, checked in as I can be in my mid-30s. We need to have that youthful energy. That's what is so exciting about AEW and on some levels WWE. But there needs to be more. There are more people of a certain age step aside the better it will be for everyone, and there will be less this kind of tension between the sensibilities of 2023 and the sensibilities of 1987. That's the hard part about working there. Those people don't, those guys don't get it sometimes, and you wish they did. They don't get it. These things are offensive today. These these kids are more sensitive than ever. It's like absolutely Dave Chappelle, right? Dave Chappelle stands up there, he cracks jokes on everybody, and then he crosses over, he cracks jokes on one of these groups you're not supposed to crack jokes about, and then people get all, they start looking at each other, making sure it's okay to laugh, you know? And you're like, and people think that this is normal. Like, listen to what he's saying. They're trying to normalize. There are ridiculous sensibilities where every 10 years, something new is offensive. That you, you're, And these things, again, being offended is a choice. It's not some genetic thing that we're finding out over time. These things are a choice. You're choosing to be offended by some of this stuff. And these things weren't always offensive. You're choosing to be offended by them. Okay? So, if you want to say, like, all all the old guys have to die and move on so that we can move into our wonderful progressive utopia where nobody's ever going to be offended until we create new things to be offended about, and then we're going to say that those things are offensive too. You know what I'm saying? But let's let's talk about the youthful energy part, because I've talked about this before. The idea that everybody's too old, nobody knows what's cool, and all this kind of stuff. Look, you want to know what kids think is cool? Listen to the radio. Watch TV. All right? Kids think that these girls with their extra long nails uh, twerking is cool. If you let some 20-something pick Bianca Belair's character, that character will look more like Cardi B than, than anything. And is that something you really want to port into American society? How is that not a stereotype, by the way? The stupid long nails, the, the ignorant manner of speech, the baby hairs on the side, the large BBL butts, all this kind of stuff. It's like, how is that not a stereotype? It, how are these people not playing in stereotypes? Rappers still wearing big dumb chains. They still got gold grills in their mouth. Now, a little of them are a little bit more effeminate. They're wearing dresses and painting their fingernails and stuff like that. But, you know, for the most part, it's mostly the same. They're still calling women bitches and hoes. Like, is it, how about we be, we bring more youthful energy and, you know, Kofi King to come out there and just call Bianca Belair like, bitch, yada, yada, yada. It'd be like, wait a minute, she can, he can't do that. But like, wait a minute, what you talking about? Young dudes call women bitches all the time. They call women hoes all the time, all through the media. They watch TV. They watch Power. All the people are fucking, you know, they calling each other bitches and hoes and killing each other. Maybe we should port that into wrestling. No, nobody would say that that's okay. So the idea that we need to have more youthful energy, it's like, what do you mean exactly? You mean we need to have more political commissars, more people shadowing these old guys around, telling them that's offensive, that's offensive, that could possibly be offensive, that's probably offensive, that's going to upset some people, that's going to upset some people, you're going to upset the older demographic, you know? Again, there have been people who have found racism in everything, especially things that are older, you know? Pretty much every single uh, pastime from Dungeons and Dragons to old video games, people have found reasons to be offended. It's, it's a pervasive situation. And these guys don't understand it, that some people are going to tell you enough's enough. They don't, they, they don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that enough's enough. They don't want to hear that you're going too far. Not everything is offensive, or even if it is offensive, most people are not going to be offended by it. You just are offended by it. And your offense, 
and your being upset is not valid all the time. You, your opinion is not the be all end all on racial gender based stuff because some women are offended by men in drag, but how many people are ignoring these women? Some black people are completely and totally offended by love and hip hop and rap music. Again, we've gone through this before. We've talked about this stuff on the channel before they used to burn and break Snoop Dogg CDs in 1992 because they were offended by the language. People ignored it, right? But they still today have this discussion about whether rap songs are too vulgar or not. Now, wrestling has decided to curtail a lot of the vulgarity. We talked about this before on this channel too. The attitude error. They kind of took a lot, they took a way to the left with the vulgarity. They went really vulgar, really hard for four or five years. And then they started trying to pull it back. And what ended up happening is the culture ended up getting more and more toxic. As wrestling regressed from some of that stuff, the, the culture would start taking it up and doing even more of it. You know, I'm talking about, when I say the culture, I mean American culture. I mean, look at American media. From Love and Hip Hop to Black Ink to the TV shows that they watch to the music that, are not, that is now on the radio to the videos of, you know, teenage black girls outside, you know, in thongs twerking and stuff like that. Wrestling ain't trying to pull that stuff anymore. So how can you have the right to sit here and complain when your daughters and shit is not going to be offended by Bianca Belair talking about, hold up, let me take my earrings off. If they're not offended by Lotto and Saweetie and whatever them hoes out there doing, if they're not offended by that, these caricatures of black women, if they're not offended by that, then how the hell are they going to be offended by this? All right. And if they are offended by this, you need to double check and make sure that you're offended by that shit too. But Here's the problem. The issue that they're going to have is they can blame white men for Bianca Belair and her earrings and her hair getting cut. They can't blame white men for Megan Thee Stallion, for Cardi B, even though they probably can because, you know, white men own the record labels. But they don't they don't blame white people for that stuff. They look at it as black women expressing themselves. You know, that's the difference. The problem is that it's all just a creation of PR departments and Hollywood secret um, individuals who are, you know, telling these girls, this is what people are responding to. This is what people are reacting to. This is what you need to lean into. And guess what? Nine times out of 10, they're right. Okay. So when you look at the culture or what young people are interested in, Young people are interested in things that are far more toxic than what we're talking about in this conversation that has anything to do with wrestling. All right. So we shouldn't be mixing these two conversations because then it becomes a what about ism, right? It becomes you're upset about Bianca Belair, but what about Megan Thee Stallion? Who is more of a stereotype? You know, the college educated super athlete or the uber thick, super long nails, um, rap chick. Like who's, who's more, who's more of a stereotype here? Like explain who's more ghetto. We want to talk about being ghetto. Who's more ghetto. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like this kind of stuff doesn't need to be mixed together. And when we start talking about young people, what young people think is cool is a lot more toxic than what we're talking about in terms of that lawsuit or we've, anything we've seen on TV. Now, in terms of uh, young people, young people have profound influence on these industries in which they don't own anything. Now, when it comes to Vince McMahon specifically, because he's the guy we're talking about here, there have been over who knows how many times people have said Vince doesn't watch, doesn't watch this movie. He's never heard of this. He's never seen this. I brought it to his attention. He said, okay, go for it. And he had never seen Scarface before Scott Hall told him about it. And he did the character. Vince was like, okay, go for it. He knows he's out of touch. Okay. It's the other people who bring him ideas and say, this is what I want to do. He had never seen this movie before. He's never heard this song before. He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know what you think he knew about Bad Bunny being one, being one of the most streamed artists in the world. I didn't even know that. I'm literally half that man's age. And I didn't know that. 
There's people who are half my age. There's, because Bad Bunny doesn't speak that much English, there's probably hood people in the entirety of the city of Detroit who didn't know that. Who probably thought the number one rapper in the world was like Kendrick Lamar or something like that. Without even knowing that there's some Spanish speaking guy out there who's even more popular. I didn't know who Logan Paul was. I'm pretty sure there's somebody there who is going to say, you want to know who's who is popping in the, with young people today that we can bring in this kid or that kid or somebody else. So the idea that these guys are old and out of touch, the real, that's not really even an excuse because they're surrounded by people who are young. They have grandchildren. They have wrestlers who are coming in from NXT or, you know, who are wrestlers who are who are already backstage and they're coming up to them with these different ideas comic book characters and video game characters and all this kind of stuff. And it, we're seeing this shit just get dumped on TV right now anyway. You know, I mean, we, we, that's what we're seeing. That's what the Apollo Crews Black Panther thing was all about. Hey, Black Panther made a billion dollars. We have an African wrestler right here, even though he's not really African. He's from California, but his parents are Nigerian. Maybe he should do a Nigerian accent. You know, maybe we can scoop up some of those millions that Marvel just made. You know what? Go for it. I mean, and then people say it's racist. So it's, 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 it's crazy. Like, uh, JTG, he's the one who came up with crime time. He, Vince doesn't know fuck all about bulletproof vests and all the, the look of the G unit from the 2000s. He didn't know fuck all about that. It took for JTG to bring that stuff to his attention. And then he put it on TV. And all of a sudden it was repelled with, this is racist. Like, oh, okay. Okay, sure. (laughs) But to me, it's all about having safe targets. These people know that Vince McMahon and all the old white guys are all safe targets. all, All the old white record executives. You can blame all the ills of the world on them. You don't like how the music is looking today. Blame it on them. You don't like how the video games and comic books and stuff look today. Just blame it on the old white guys. You can do it better, but you need their money to do it. You need their money and their platform to do it. How about creating your own? How about that? There is a black guy named Baron Black. He created Hood Slam, which is a mixture of hip hop and pro wrestling. You don't hear anybody talking about that. He's a black wrestler, too. Like the, the GCW does for the culture shows. Nobody talks about them, you know? So everybody wants to sit around and call WWE racist. Nobody actually wants to put their, put support behind a GCW for the culture show. So that like, again, that's all about bringing in your black friends because you've got a complaint that needs to be filed in the race department. All right. I've talked long enough. I'll talk to you guys later. Peace.